Latin America, the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, Africa, and Asia. Lorena Hilar also served as a vice chancellor of Costa Rica. She has been a pioneer in the creation of influential international gender networks, such as the network of women ministers and leaders of the environment and the Global Gender and Climate Alliance. Lorena has authored numerous publications on gender, sustainable development, disaster reduction, forest, water, health, and environment, and is an engaging speaker at international conferences, congresses, and other high level events. Today, Lorena will be sharing her thoughts with us on women's empowerment and gender equality at the center of climate action. So, uh, bienvenida, Lorena. The microphone is all yours. Gracias, Lourdes. Thank you very much to uh, everyone. And thank you very much for the organizers for this invitation, especially for the Kashak Institute for having me here. So let me start by sharing my screen. Hope you can see it. Okay, let's see. Can you all see it? Yes. Okay, what I'm gonna share with you is a long history, as Lourdes was saying, of more than 30 years of trying to make the linkages between gender and the environmental sector. And it has not been an easy ride. When we started with this process, there was little to none appetite, neither in the environmental sector nor in the women's sector to address environment and its linkages to gender equality. Uh, with Wangari Matai, I remember going to all these meetings in which we were told this is not important, we have more important issues uh, to do. So I'm going to share with you this story of how we have been um, mainstreaming or bringing gender considerations into uh, the work. So I would like to to start acknowledging IPCC. Definitely, all of us know that we're, we're toward the edge of a cliff. Humanity has unleashed more than a trillion tons of CO2 since the start of the Industrial Revolution and fueling an average global temperature rise of more than one degree Celsius compared to 19th century. And those emissions, even though we cease them tomorrow, has set in motion a certain amount of irreversible uh, change. So let's see. I mean, IPCC tell us that if we go over one CC, which we have already one degree, 14% of the world population will be vulnerable to severe and deadly heat waves. But if we get to two degrees, this figure jumps to 37%. Uh, when it comes to water shortages, if we go to two degrees, which we are on our path, it will mean that we will move from 350 million city dwellers worldwide that are facing water shortages to almost 411 million uh, people. And when it comes to sea level rise, this is what we're seeing. Reports estimate that a boost of sea level rise as much as 90 centimeters will mean um, that people will be at risk 80 more uh, million people worldwide. So this is the scenario that we have when we talk about climate change. But how does this find the women? I mean, I'm sorry. Um, also, humanity has wiped out 60% of the mammals, the birds, the fish, and the reptiles between the 70s and 2014. So if we look that, if we compare that to the scale of what we have done, it is like if we have declined 60% of the human population, that would be equivalent to emptying North America, South America, Africa, Europe, China, and Oceania. This is the scale of, we have, of what we have done. So how does this find the women of the world? And the discussion that Lourdes and Freya was having, uh, we talk about structural knots of gender inequality. There are six structural knots that interact with climate change. It's not 
that we're more vulnerable because of our condition. But these are the structural knots of gender inequality, social economic inequality and persistence of poverty, inequitable control of access to natural resources, including land or especially land, the lack of limited access to markets and capital, the patriarchal and discriminatory and violent cultural patterns amongst the other ones are how it finds the women of the world when it comes to um, climate change. And how do these knots are visibilized? Well, according to the World Bank of 143 economies, 90% have at least one law restricting economic equality of women. When we talk about women being represented, only 4% of chairs of the World Energy Council are women. And only 44 countries, according to OCTI, uh, women have the same inheritance rights as uh, women. And over 2.7 billion women are legally restricted from having same choices of jobs as men. And even in those countries, uh, that recognize uh, women the same rights as men to land own. Uh, here you have the example of the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, where you can see, I mean, we cannot even make the women the size that they should be because they would have disappeared from the film, but you can see how that is uh, seen. And even in countries like mine, Costa Rica, in which women um, do have the same rights to own land, we only own 15.6% of the land. And our land is also smaller in size, um, not only that we don't have the same possibilities. So talking about those structural knots of inequality and how they interact, we have talked about um, droughts um, in the previous uh, panelist. And there are at the moment an incredible amount of perversive um, adaptation schemes like the child droughts of the drought into which uh, girls are being sold uh, to have some money for their families to survive. And things that we cannot even imagine. Sometimes people say, oh yes, climate change, it affects the same way women and men. But things like sea level rise in coastal areas uh, do have a differentiated impact. When I was working in Bangladesh, we found at the end of the Delta that there was an increase 30% higher uh, than the average of the rest of the country in clumsia and preclumsia. And what we found out is that yes, everybody was drinking water that was contaminated by the sea saline water, but in pregnant women, this had a differentiated impact. Uh, drinking that saline water had an increase in preeclampsia and uh, clampsia. Disasters. We had seen uh, a dramatic increase of disasters in the last uh, decades. Uh, we had seen, for example, that the number of people exposed to flooding every year has increased by 114%. That global physical exposure to tropical cyclones almost tripled. And that a single hurricane hit can lead to a reduction in a country annual GDP up to 800%. So uh, there was a study conducted by Numerier and Plumper from uh, the London School of Economic. And they found after analyzing 141 uh, disasters worldwide, that in those countries in which the gender gaps were broader, this is the ratio of death that they found for every man, four women. And this is, something that I can only explain with a story. When I was working in Honduras during Mitch, that was one of the biggest hurricanes that have ever, ever faced um, our region. There was a woman called Doña Vera in the coasts of um, Honduras. She lived in a house made of zinc and cardboard. And uh, her friend came and said, Vera, I heard on the radio that there are winds of 220 kilometers coming. Vera had never gone to school, not even driving a bicycle. And she said, how much are 220 kilometers? Is that too much? Is that too little? They had never been invited to any prevention, risk, disaster type of meetings. 
And they decided wrongly to start walking by the Stuarium. Vera at the time had three kids. She tied her baby to herself as we do in this part of the world and carry the other two kids by her side. And they start walking by the Stuarium, something that you don't do in a disaster of this type. And then the waves and the waters coming from uh, all the way from the mountains caught them. She was able to climb into a tree only with one of her kids, the one that was tied to her. And she lost the other two kids. Um, she was rescued later on and taken to a refugee camp. And um, her words were, you know what happens to a single woman. She was raped, what she was at the camp. And then she was brought back to her place of where she was living. There was nothing left. Her house was all gone. I'm sorry that the train is going to go by. That's part of being at home. So excuse for the sound of the train. And um, when she came back, an NGO came and said, Vera, we're going to help you reconstruct your house, but you only have to give us, there it goes, one thing, the titles of your property. And she didn't have them. So Tonya Vera really said, definitely, this hurricane has something more against women than it had uh, with men. Care work is another very important area which is just barely being grasped um, when it comes to climate change. And we did a lot of effort uh, on the, the latest CSW 66 to make those linkages. However, if you look at the gender action plans from all around the world, from different um, mechanisms for women advancements, you don't see the link in the, in the programs. You barely see these links in the national determined contribution documents, but definitely there is a women's and girls disproportionate share of unpaid care and domestic work uh, that is intensified in climate and environmental crisis and disasters and understanding care work and the rights to care and the impact of caregivers must be definitely at the center of a comprehending the gender impacts of environmental degradation and climate change. But it's, it's rather new when it comes, especially at the policy uh, level. Environmental defenders, the more we disrupt destroy the environment, the more intense climate change uh, becomes. We're seeing more and more and more environmental defenders all around the world. Um, in 2020, we see 227 defenders that were killed. This is the year with the most uh, deaths recorded, an average of four uh, per week. But this also has a women face. Um, and especially in my part of the world, of the 10 countries in the world with the highest register attacks against defender, seven are in Latin America. And our women defenders are exposed to gender-based violence, challenge the patriarchal culture and the gender stereotypes. And the risks are heightened by misogyny and attacks against them. Unfortunately, they're underestimated. Uh, um, they're never, barely recorded in remote um, areas and the rural sector. So with all this in mind, what do we have been doing at the international level? For the past 30 years, we have been working very, very hard in trying to make these linkages in bringing gender in the environmental sector in what it called the MIAs, the multilateral environmental um, agreements. We succeed in bringing um, gender, for example, in the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention to Combat Desertification. But UNFCCC, that is the Convention Dealing with Climate Change, was created without any mention of gender equality. And it was not until 2008 that we created this huge alliance, the Global Gender and Climate Change Alliance, that we start seeing a paradigm shift. Today, as of 2021, uh, last COP, we have been able to uh, produce 87 uh, mandates. And there are some very important turning points. I mean, you have to understand that the linkages between gender and climate change, with exception of a little bit on disasters, we're not there. We had to start creating the, that knowledge. We have to start building that capacity on the decision makers. 
and um, we were able to produce these 87 mandates, but there are definitely uh, some turning points. Uh, the first one in Cancun is uh, linking gender and mitigation, not mitigation of, this act of disasters, but the reduction of emissions. And that was the first decision on RET, that is reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. We were able to have a mandate for the first time, a financing mechanism like the Green Climate Fund, that from the onset, from its beginning, there had a mandate to have a gender policy and a gender action plan. Um, already, um, Freya talked about uh, the Lima work program on gender. It, it was a very intense negotiation to get the Lima work program on gender, and it had years behind to get to where we were. And it was for the first time in which we used the term um, gender responsive uh, policies and, and actions. And, and precisely, um, we had to move from gender equality because most of the, of the negotiators from various regions of the world wouldn't accept it. So we went for gender responsive and we tried to bring this conception of gender gaps, of those gender gaps produced by those genders inequality knots into the convention. It also took us a long time um, for the principles in the Paris um, Agreement, a guiding principle. People said, oh, is there is just one mention of the preambular. Yes, it took three years to get that wording in. We weren't successful in getting it on the operational ones. And now we have the two gender action plans and we are in the process of defining the next gender action plan and CSW 66, in which it was the first time that the mechanisms of women affairs embrace the topic of climate um, change. So what are we seeing around the world? All these years, this has taken years in the making, 30 years in the making of getting where we are. So what are we seeing when we talk about women's of agents of change? Well, the last two executive secretaries of UNFCCC have been Latin American women, one of them being Cristiana Figueres from Costa Rica. We have seen, for example, how in the renewable energy sector, which at the beginning nobody was given assent for it, we have seen women going 10 points higher than in the traditional energy industries, having a 32 uh, representation of workers. Women globally, we earned uh, 13 trillion, which is double the combined GDPs of China and India. And by 2028, we will be responsible for about two thirds of consumers spending um, worldwide. We have incredible initiatives uh, worldwide. We have this initiative in Australia that is called the One Million Women Initiative. And they have committed to cut over 100,000 tons of CO2. This is like taking 240,000 cars off the road. And that have created this incredible app that I will invite all of you to download that shows in real time our collective impact as women in the reduction of emissions. You have examples like this waste to wow. Um, Quid is a women-led eco-fashion enterprise in Verona, Italy, that what it does is that it recycles high quality fabric waste from fashion. And it has a company in which 85% of women with 70% of women that are disadvantaged. Uh, migrant women's, uh, abuse women's. And they have been able to reduce 200 tons of textiles recovered and recycled, 18,000 tons of CO2 and 1,000 tons of sulfur um, dioxide have been avoided, uh, 60 million kilowatts of energy saved, and a half a million tons water, 650 tons of chemical wash and dye fabrics, and 300 tons of coloring products saved. We have a solar power company. In, uh, this is a fascinating story. If you, if you can go to the website of Momentum for Change that is called Women uh, Pillars for Action, you can see uh, Wandi is this incredible woman uh, who led uh, the first largest solar farm in Thailand. And when she went to the banks to ask for funding for this, nobody could believe that this was um, important. 
Uh, right now, Wandi has 34 solar farms and uh, she recruits high caliber women, but it's also uh, training and empowerment, empowering the next generation of business women in renewables. Financing. In addition to all this work that we have done um, at the international policy level and at the national policy level, we were able um, to really have an impact in all the major financing mechanisms associated with climate change. All of them at the moment have some mandate, uh, either a gender policy or a plan uh, of actions. And uh, the problem is that this, um, what, the challenge that we have right now is that this climate finance architecture is not designed for small groups, organizations to participate. We have a little example on the adaptation fund in which they have opened this possibility. And definitely this new green transition that everybody is talking about um, could become if we really developed the right criteria, and, and we're trying to do that in um, ECLAC, that is the commission, the Latin American commission, to design those criteria of what a just and inclusive uh, transition should look like and how, based on these uh, structural knots of inequality, what are the criteria that we have to really take into consideration to close uh, those gender gaps. So we have all around the world, like the examples that I show you, some promising practices. And all of them share uh, what I call the right eyes for um, working on gender equality and women empowerment in climate change. They're inclusive. They have an impact on the reduction of emissions and or adaptation when we're talking about climate change. They improve the quality of life but they bring a lot of innovation. I mean, we are moving away from type of initiatives and projects that only see women as the one taking care of the chickens, of the pigs, of the uh, back gardens into new type of uh, projects that are really raising the roof of the household and uh, making women uh, real changers. Um, in this process. And they impulse transformational change. Um, they're not just uh, there as, as a one stand um, event. And we have examples like the ones that I, I just show you, but for example, the development of this award, the GIGUP, it's, it's an award for uh, productive units that took into account that to receive what it's called payment for environmental services that are schemes all around the world. Unfortunately, they're tied to land tenure. So this scheme, what it does, or this award, what it does is that it, this links the payment of environmental services if you are an owner of the land. And it creates a series of criteria that were developed with the women uh, from rural and uh, different uh, communities, indigenous community, Afro-descendant communities. And if you have a score of 85 or more, then you can benefit for this payment for um, environmental services. We have this proposal, for example, in Egypt, uh, in the development of what is called the Climate Change Gender Action Plan, in which women um, negotiated with the Ministry of Transport that they were outside, that they were really uh, facing the impact of the contamination, that the stops were not what they needed, that the transportation was what they needed. And they uh, presented this initiative to use the Nile as, uh, which is not used for public transportation in which they will own the company and they will define uh, the stops and the way that they were uh, working. So there are a lot of examples. I also invite you to visit uh, the CCGAPs, the Climate Change Gender Action Plans. 26 countries around the world have developed these uh, CC gaps with this innovative new way of making the linkages between gender and um, climate change. But we do face a lot of challenges uh, still. We need to promote and protect the rights of all women and girls related to the enjoyment of this uh, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And we still need to adopt policies and programs for the enjoyment of these rights including by addressing the impacts of climate change and environmental 
um, degradation. Knowledge, a lot of you um, work in this section, in the academia, but we need more knowledge and more research and more data. For example, and it's not only on gender statistics uh, in the environmental sector, because we found there, yes, there is a lack of awareness of the value of sex desegregated uh, data. The systems are not designed to capture the complexities of social, economic, and environmental interactions in territories. The quality of the data is sometimes very poor and uh, they're not used and their dissemination is limited. Even in countries that have done major efforts to enhance uh, these gender statistics like Mexico, you see that they don't inform the policy process. But also when you look at the global gender indexes, environmental indicators are not included in them. So it, it's, it's a two way road that we need to walk when we talk about knowledge research in data. Uh, we need to support and finance gender responsive and, and equitable just transitions toward the low emission energy systems. And, and this includes all the clean power generation and energy efficiency measures and the potential of ecosystem-based approaches or nature-based solutions. And there, there, is, there has been a major discussions of what the feminist groups understands as nature-based solutions, but we need to start developing those criteria. And, and we're a little bit late in some countries already in which they are producing these policies and these frameworks for this uh, just uh, transition. And here is important to mention that not everything that is green is just or inclusive in that sense. Capacity building. But this transition to a development styles that seeks a balance with the planet, healthy planet, healthy people in a more just world requires new knowledges, theoretical and methodological approaches but they're very specialized. It's not gender and environment as a whole. You're talking about urban planning. You're talking about integrated forest management, energy and emission reductions, transport, mobility. And it's imperative that this knowledge needs to be specialized. These training processes that derive from this knowledge also needs to be tailor-made, uh, made, um, to respond to those specific needs of the sector. So when we work in climate change, we need to understand that not all of us, um, gender specialists, can really provide the input that, that is required in all these uh, different um, sectors. And to start closing, I have to say that um, there are no gender neutral interventions across the scope of environmental change, that we represent 3.65 billion solutions. And it will be logical to ignore this powerful resource for a sustainable world. Action against climate change, as we have seen worldwide, can reinforce or exacerbate inequalities or intentionally aim to overcome them and accelerate progress toward gender equality and women's empowerment as regulatory, physical, economic, and social cultural structures are examined in response to climate change, long-standing gender inequalities must be identified and addressed. Thank you very much. And, and just, I think that we cannot abuse and exploit the earth. Uh, and it is past time we realize that the same is true for women. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorena, for such a fascinating talk. Um, I liked so many aspects of your, of your talk, including the fact that you highlighted very nicely the structures of inequality and explained how they all come together um, to, make, um, to make it for women, um, to make the situation, the climate situation even more aggravated for women. Um, I also, I was really nicely impressed by your suggestions to put care at the center of, uh, of climate actions. I think that's crucial, especially after the pandemic, which has uh, shown that, um, that care responsibilities have gotten even greater uh, for women in, in, in times such as this. And, and, and for closing with such uh, 
great and inspiring, promising practices and initiatives. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to check the websites and, and try, I'm going to try to find more details about the, the, the brilliant initiatives that you share with us. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has any thoughts, comments, or questions for Lorena. As I mentioned, you can type them on the chat or you can just raise your hand and I'll, be, I'll keep an eye on both the chat and, and the hands. Lourdes, on, on, on that like, last comment that you make, sure. on, it's quite interesting because um, I have conducted an analysis of all the national reports, uh, and this is, for example, the national determined contribution reports, the national biodiversity reports, the drought reports, the CEDAO reports. And it's amazing to see the lack of interconnectedness between gender, climate change, and care. Very, very little. When you look at the CEDAW reports, it's, it's almost absent, um, totally. Uh, there is only um, some few reports on droughts produced under the Convention on Drylands that do mention the topic of care and droughts. And there are two incredible examples, because I have not seen them before, of the psychological effect. This is especially in the documents from Venezuela and Central Africa, in which um, women that cannot provide for this role of care that they have been assigned by society are committing suicide when they cannot. But this is one of the first times um, that I have come up with this. So uh, this is something that we're working a lot. Um, we were able uh, to bring the topic of uh, care and climate change into the CSW 66 discussions. But when you look for literature and how it has been addressed, uh, theoretical linkages, there's very little uh, to none um, documentation on this topic. Thanks very much, Lorena, for those extra and, and very interesting thoughts. Uh, I think uh, V is raising her hand. V, you can um, unmute yourself and thank you. Lorena, thank you for, for a fascinating talk. Um, Last year's military global military spending exceeded two trillion dollars for the first time ever in human history. It's at 2.1 trillion dollars. And that was before the massive increase in, in militarization that uh, an arm spending that has been promoted or provoked by, by the Ukraine crisis, the, the, inv the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and, and I was very pleased uh, that you pointed out that all of the new sort of environmental mechanisms um, have actually got some sort of mention of gender equality. But, you know, what, what we saw during the COVID lockdown, which we can see as an environmental crisis, was that funding simply did not, uh, governments did not release funding for the relief of people's impoverishment who were unable to reach their very um, badly, badly paid daily wages. Um, what do you think, or how do you think we can start to understand the incredible necessity of, again, tackling military spending uh, as a means to release resources for this desperately needed work that we that we um, that we have to that we have ahead of us to try to do something about climate? Have you have you given that any thought? I mean, for me, that's one of the biggest silos. You talk about these lacks of references you know, across documents, but we just don't seem to be making that connection. Yeah. No, Vanessa, thank you for that question. No, we're, we're not. It's one of the areas, again, that is also lacking a little bit more of involvement from uh, different groups to do that. I don't know if you're aware about Equality Forum. This is an initiative launched by the French government and the Mexican government in which we have six different um, axes of work. Uh, and they're, they're pretty much on silos still, but there is a great opportunity to bring the topics that you're doing because one of them is climate change and one of them is financing and one of them deals with peace and 1325 and, and all these elements. But I think that the possibility of engaging more stakeholders into that discussion is instrumental. Georgetown University with um, also has been doing uh, some work in this sense, but definitely that's a field in which we need to work more. 
But it's also very important, uh, Vanessa, for people to really grasp and understand, because it took us 10 years to get all these financial mechanisms with policies and programs. But when you talk on the ground and, and you talk with a women movement, they have very little understanding of what those resources are and what they can ask for and how they can tap to. There is a lack of acknowledgement of these areas because it is, it's not their natural niche of work, but there is a tremendous amount of money that we need to understand how we can really move it toward and not, and, and this is not adding gender into already go, ongoing projects. I think we need to develop more initiative from women um, inside this, and this is being done by us, for us, according to our needs, and just not running behind everybody to mainstream it and, and get some petty coins at the end of, of the line. But I think there is a, a lot of lack of understanding of how we can uh, access those resources. Thanks, Lorena. Thanks, V, for your question. Um, we have ten, no, nine more minutes. So uh, if anyone else wishes to ask a question or share some thoughts with us, um, again, you can just raise your hand, type it on the chat. Um, while people think about further questions, Ali, you are unmuting yourself? The, yeah, I, I sure. it could jump in. And I don't know, there, this is for Lorena, but V, you might have some thoughts about this too. I, I think, you know, where, where we started today was thinking about, uh, I think V said this in her opening remarks. So, you know, some of the ways in which those international structures seem, seem so um, structurally unsound and uh, uh, that refrain that we keep talking about, about the way to, um, institutions prevent adaptations and it's easy to be despairing. And I appreciate uh, Lorena's comments about all the things that are going on. And I just wonder, even Lorena, from your personal standpoint of just working within those structures, um, you know, what you feel is possible or how you maintain your optimism, um, it, you know, I, cause I think we're, we're kind of hearing two different things that so you need to work on this multilateral level. Cause otherwise you can't address, uh, crises of this magnitude, like the climate crisis, but at the same time, you know, we're working in institutions that are deeply flawed. No, Alexandra, you th your thoughts are very important because sometimes you feel like you have spent thousands of um, hours uh, walking in corridors to negotiate text that then nobody knows about it and is not getting implemented. Uh, I think that the need to raise ambition, and I'll just make a question to all of you. How many of you have read your national determined contribution document from your country? So you need to do that because those are the countries what they're committing to address climate change, adaptation and mitigation. And the first group of NDCs, 40% included gender, um, this time we're seeing a lot more, but that is an instrumental entry point. You need to define how you are going to have an impact in those NDCs from the institutions that you are, from the positions that you are. You can be in the academia, you can be working on the ground, but you need to be part of those discussions. You need to frame them. You need to ask for accountability. Those 87 mandates that have taken us tears, to be honest, to achieve, need to be unfold. This is the time for implementation. We have enough mandates, we have the structure, uh, but now we need the uh, implementation. But there is a lack of information. I mean, again, how many of you knows the NDCs? And that is the instrument of your countries uh, to in, um, work on climate change. I think that's super helpful and something that we don't often hear about the barrier of getting linking the money that's available with local organizations and then making those connections with a broader public sphere to these documents that, as you say, are, you know, negotiating texts in the halls of power uh, that seem quite remote. And I really appreciate you flagging that and pointing that as a uh, out as an area where we could do more research and be more active and teach more and all of those things. 
Yeah, I think it is instrumental. I mean, especially for um, the academia um, to really bring this down and this style this and, and give the instruments uh, to the students to really engage. Uh, the efforts that you're doing, for example, through the institutes are instrumental to make the students um, have access to the processes that are happening, to understand, to know the knowledge, to know the players, and to know from their positions what they can do to really have an impact in reducing gender equality and women's empowerment in this area of work. Thanks, Lorena, for these further thoughts. I'm checking if anyone else wishes to ask a question, make a comment. Um, uh, I don't see anything on the chat. But while people think about further questions, perhaps I can I can ask one myself, uh, Lorena, if that's all right. Um, so speaking of implementation, I was wondering whether you could say a few words, you have any thoughts on the the Escazú agreement, and especially since you mentioned um, the situation of um, environmental defenders in Latin America, especially women, whether you see any potential in that agreement um, to protect, to defend, uh, uh, human rights and environmental defenders in the region. Lourdes, I'm going to be a little bit biased because it was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and my office <laughs> directly, which we work on the text of the ESCASU agreement. So I have to say I will be a little bit biased in the sense, but, but I will take the words of the um, uh, environmental special invoice. And he recognizes that the ESCASU agreement is one of the most important agreements in the past 20 years that links environment and human rights. Um, again, the problem is going to be how that is going to be unfold at the national level when it comes um, to the development of the bylaws associated uh, with it. But um, some days ago, we held the first COP uh, of the Escazú Agreement in, in Chile. So it's, it's a, an important uh, breaking moment for our region in which is one of the most uh, unequal regions of the world in which you saw the data that I presented, one in which the environmental defenders, uh, we are the most uh, risky region in the world to be an environmental defender. And a women environmental defender has a double uh, weight in, in some of us. So um, I think the Escazú agreement is something that we could export definitely to other regions of the world. And uh, now that we're trying to bring into the General Assemble, Assembly the right for a clean environment as a human right is something that I think all of us need to work on that. Thanks again, Lorena. Oh, it's wonderful to find out that you were part of the, <laughs> that you played an active role in the, in the well, the, 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 the making of the Iskazu Agreement. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, just checking any, anyone else uh, before we close this session, we have two more minutes. Uh, so I'm briefly going over. Um, I wonder if everyone is, is, is like me, is feeling like a lot of information, but if you, you please have a look in the chat boxes, I put some links into the national, nationally determined contributions. And I'm also to go and have a look a little bit more at gender um, uh, national action plans on gender and climate change, just to just to help people orientate themselves to these very practical suggestions that you made. Thank you. I just want to thank you, Lorena, again. I, I think, you know, the chance to hear from you and from Helena earlier today, you know, people have been working on these things for decades at the highest levels um, is, is incredible is incredibly powerful and especially that you um you know that you're sharing remarks that are really that are really directed towards this audience and letting people know how they can intervene and what they can teach and what they need to pay attention to it's it's really a meaningful uh to have you here so thank you thank you thank you for that no thank you for the invitation and i'm always here available um, for anything that uh, you want. And, and, and we need more allies. Sometimes it gets a little bit lonely uh, in this front. Uh, so as more people we can get into it, especially youth who has been very strong on this topic, 
please count me on and I'm always here for you. Thank Gracias, you. Gracias, Lorena. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Lorena, you. very much. Um, well, um, well, it's 11.45, so I guess we'll be reconvening in 15 minutes, if that's fine, Ali. Uh, so, yeah, 12 p.m. 